Hello everyone, and welcome to the 151st episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring our patron pick for October 2023, Jason Voorhees, from the Friday the 13th franchise. Jason is a member of the big four slasher villains that rocketed the genre to success, an unstoppable machine of murderous rage that's ready to slice anyone he sees into pieces without hesitation. In this video, we're first going to cover what we know about how Jason evolved into the man we see in these films, and afterwards, we'll evaluate what we've learned to discern just how evil the man behind the hockey mask truly is. Now with Without further ado, let's begin. Jason Voorhees was born on June 13, 1946, to Pamela and Elias Voorhees in Crystal Lake, New Jersey. Now, not too much is known about Jason's father, and there are a variety of reasons why depending on the story you're reading. It could be, as the comic Pamela's Tale suggests, that the abusive and callous Elias was murdered by his wife once she'd finally reached her wit's end and had enough of his transgressions, an act that in her mind was spurred on by the still gestating Jason speaking to her telepathically. It could be that once Elias learned of either his son's deformities or his wife's over-obsessive attitude towards Jason, he chose to leave her then. Or perhaps Elias passed away or left for completely different reasons. Whatever the case may be, Elias' absence in Jason's life makes it appear as if his influence on Jason's upbringing was minuscule at best. However, that couldn't be further from the truth, considering what his absence has done to Pamela, who had a tremendous amount of influence on Jason's life. Now again, we don't really know for a fact how Elias and Pamela's relationship ended, but regardless of how it ended, it certainly had an impact on her mental health and overall well-being in a number of different ways. But the most important factor to consider here is how her husband's absence pushed her towards an over-attachment to her son. Obviously, being attached to your child isn't wrong, but an over-attachment to any person can be harmful if it's taken to an extreme degree, and that's just what happened to Pamela. In a small rural town like Crystal Lake, it can be a bit difficult to make romantic connections with others considering the small pool of available individuals, and this becomes even more true if you're a single mother, especially during this time period. Add in the fact that Jason was born with physical deformities and an unnamed medical condition, and you find yourself with a woman whose entire world is centered around her son. However, loneliness in a small town like Crystal Lake wasn't enough to cause Pamela to form such an attachment to her son. It was her son's condition, alongside her loneliness, that significantly enhanced the already strong feelings she had for him. Being the parent of a handicapped child in the 40s must have been hard enough, but being a single parent at that who was forced to contend with the loss of their spouse in the process took the adversity her son's condition imposed upon her to the next level. Pamela not only had to provide for her son all on her own, she also had to protect him from a world that had no compassion for his condition. People who would sooner ostracize the young Jason as a freak than they would offer him any sort of kindness. So Pamela made sure that her son was as safe as he possibly could be from the outside world, keeping him at home with her as much as she could by homeschooling him and by restricting his exposure to the other people of Crystal Lake. Now Pamela's attachment to her son and her decision to keep him safe in this way might have been perfectly fine, as Jason was likely going to live with her for all of her life and for the majority of his. But any sort of stable relationship and living situation they might have had was utterly ruined when Jason almost drowned due to the negligence of the counselors at Camp Crystal Lake. Pamela took on a job at Camp Crystal Lake as its cook, and because she couldn't afford to have a nanny look after Jason, she took him with her to work. Considering this was a camp filled with children who were supposed to be watched constantly by the camp's counselors, it should have been the perfect place to take a child to be watched while you work. However, one fateful day when Pamela was working away in the kitchen, the counselors decided to engage in some extracurricular loving, and these children, who of course had been bullying Jason throughout his stay due to his differences and the way he clung to his mom, chose to push him into the lake as a prank, and it was a cruel one at that, considering Jason didn't know how to swim. When the flailing Jason didn't resurface, everyone assumed that he drowned, and after the authorities combed the lake for his corpse and couldn't find one, that fact was seemingly confirmed, an event which broke his mother's already fragile mind into a million little pieces. Unbeknownst to everyone involved, Jason actually survived this ordeal, and when he washed up on shore cold and alone, he fled into the woods, and when you consider that the only direction in life Jason had received at this point was from his mother, I'm sure his first move was to await the coming of the only person who ever cared for him, and when that didn't happen, Jason wandered the wilderness until he found a crumbling shack, which would end up being his home for over 20 years. Now, it might seem strange that a young boy was able to hide himself from the world for so long, especially when you consider that Camp Crystal Lake reopened the following year. However, Jason, who had already been conditioned to shy away from the public by his mother, also experienced the trauma of being nearly drowned once he finally did have exposure to that public. So it makes sense that he'd avoid any contact with other people, 
It might also seem quite strange that nobody happened upon Jason's shanty, though you have to consider that the camp was only reopened that one year following Jason's supposed drowning, as Pamela made great efforts to ensure that the camp stayed closed by committing her first two murders in the first film, then by poisoning the water supply with arsenic, and finally by starting several fires on the campgrounds, all of which hampered any efforts the Christie family made to reopen the camp in the following years. So since Jason was isolated, and purposefully hiding himself while there were people at the camp, and there weren't very many there in the years following, it seems like it would have been relatively easy for him to evade anyone trekking into his domain, and so Jason remained hidden from everyone, including his mother, who as I've already said made several attempts to avenge her son by murdering the counselors who were supposed to be watching him, and by keeping the camp closed so no one else might desecrate her son's resting place or cause a similar accident to happen in the future. It wasn't until the camp finally reopened in 1979 and his mother went on her infamous killing spree that Jason would finally emerge from his hiding place. Unfortunately for both Jason and the countless people who would tread on this hallowed ground following his emergence, Jason couldn't have picked a worse time to venture from his ramshackle abode. For whatever reason, the night that his mother was having her final struggle with Alice and lost her head, Jason was there to witness it. And just as his supposed drowning caused something to snap within Pamela, witnessing his mother's decapitation caused something to snap within Jason. This would be a traumatic moment for anyone's child to witness. But because of their rather unique situation, there's something peculiar that both Jason and his mother share with one another, that being auditory hallucinations of one another's voices. Throughout her killing spree, we see that Pamela is continually being spurred on by delusions of her son speaking to her believing that what she's doing is not just what she wants, but what Jason wants. Who knows just how much of her spree Jason witnessed, but once Jason finds his mother murdering people, it stands to reason that he would attempt to mimic that behavior, as he'd always followed his mother's example, and that becomes even more true once he's given a reason to kill beyond just following her example, that being avenging his mother just like she was avenging him. And if we follow the logic that Pamela was all Jason really ever knew, it could be that Jason had been hearing his mother's voice the entire time he was living in the forest, a guiding light that helped him to navigate the only world he now inhabited. Once he'd experienced his mother's demise, that voice transformed into the only thing occupying his thoughts, the incessant droning of the only woman he'd ever loved, pushing him to hurt the people who had hurt the both of them the most. The connection that Jason and his mother share could be considered a sort of folie à deux, that is a shared delusion between two or more people. That's not exactly the case here, and Jason and his mother are experiencing similar delusions to one another, not the same delusions. And this more seems to be a case of mommy knows best, and I follow mommy, than a true folie I do. Regardless, what happens following this moment is the transformation of Jason from a lonesome and scared man eking out his existence in the wilderness into a certified monster hell-bent on murdering anyone who dares to tread in his territory or who crosses his path anywhere else. In every story that we find Jason in, his circumstances and appearance differ slightly, but overall Jason remains much the same person as he was in his first appearance in the second film. There are no real thoughts or actions we receive from Jason beyond his desire to kill anyone and everyone unfortunate enough to enter his crosshairs, and in that that regard, Jason is rather one-dimensional, as there is never a moment throughout any of the myriad films, books, comic books, video games, or any other piece of media that you can think of, that Jason isn't simply acting as a killing machine who never speaks, and never deviates from his intended purpose. The only time we're really given any insight into a component of Jason's psyche outside of what we've already discussed, is when Freddy reveals to us that Jason is afraid of water, but even then, that doesn't really add too much to our established view of his character. Both alive and undead, he's nothing more more than a vengeance-fueled murder machine, and during the many times that he's returned to the world of the living to cause mayhem, Jason has murdered hundreds of people, a blood-soaked path that began with a delusion-derived quest to avenge his mother, that then evolved into just a drive to kill no matter who might end up on the wrong side of his machete. So with everything we've discussed in mind, we now need to talk about something very important. If everything Jason has become, and everything he does, was essentially out of his control, and if Jason is more or less acting on pure instinct, as he moves from one murder to the next, is Jason really evil? Evil. I'm not so sure. Of course what Jason does is evil. He's an undead serial killer. But are Jason's actions intentionally malicious? And furthermore, does Jason even understand what evil really is? Jason certainly knows why he's doing what he's doing. But what I'm proposing to you now is that Jason doesn't really know any better, and there's about as much moral weight to his actions as there would be if we were evaluating the rampages of a hunger-crazed beast. All Jason ever knew was his mother, and once that was taken from him via his false drowning, he grew up in the wilderness completely isolated from any other human beings. So how could Jason form 
form any sort of moral compass given the circumstances of his upbringing. What sort of empathy can a person who's already suffering from a mental handicap develop when all he knows is what his mother has shown or told him? You could argue that Jason is something unholy, a being of pure evil that, while relatively mindless, is fully aware of his actions, which was what the film Jason Goes to Hell is seemingly trying to impart upon us. Even if Jason is a scion of hell, he's still an unwilling one, a boy who was crafted into a bastion of evil, not one who became one willingly. Even when Jason isn't the sole operator during his killing sprees, and he's assisted by someone else like, say, Freddy, Jason really isn't to blame for anything here either, as it's Freddy pulling the strings and pointing Jason towards his intended target. To make matters worse, there are a few times throughout this franchise where people attempt to use Jason to enrich themselves, such as in the comic book Friday the 13th Bloodbath, where we find a group of executives looking to profit off both Jason and a renewed Camp Crystal Lake, and in the film Jason X, where we find Dr. Wimmer willing to endanger countless innocents in order to research Jason's immortality. Jason was once an innocent child, but now he's little more than a wild animal, an animal that progressively becomes more lost to the base fire of mindless murder that drives him and his immortal form. You can put him on a boat, send him to the city, or launch him into outer space, and he'll react just as well as a starving tiger would in such a scenario. So in the story of Jason Voorhees, where does the true evil lie? Not within Jason nor even his mother, but within the evil that can occur as a result of negligence. Don't get me wrong, the murders that Jason and his mother have committed are horrific, but both of these individuals are committing these murders due to their fractured mental health, which is far more understandable, if not excusable, than it would be if they were bereft of their respective illnesses. There's a reason why people who are found to be criminally insane are typically institutionalized rather than placed in a prison, because their crimes, while heinous and inexcusable, only occurred because they were sick. After all, how can one blame an unsound mind, as if it were sound, when committing atrocities. You can, but you shouldn't, as if the person in question weren't suffering from their condition, they probably wouldn't have committed whatever crimes they committed. Yes, Jason and his mother both had several issues that they would have had to contend with over the course of their lives, but unless Pamela was poised to snap one day, regardless of whether or not she believed her son lost his life, then in all likelihood, Jason and his mother would have led relatively normal lives. It was not Pamela nor Jason that ignited the evil actions they undertook. It was the negligence of two teenagers who decided it was more important to make love than it was to perform their jobs. Neglect itself isn't necessarily evil, but everyone is guilty of having neglected something or someone during their lifetime. The danger that neglect presents, even if it seems innocent enough, are the ramifications that come as a result of that neglect, which is what occurred with both Jason and his mother. Were Barry and Claudette aware that what they were doing was going to cause a boy and his mother to turn into homicidal maniacs? No, of course not, but they also should have been more aware of their actions and their duty to the children under their care. I get it, we've all been there, riddled with hormones and ready to make whoopee at a moment's notice. But that's no excuse to leave children under your care to their own devices. With that in mind, these two counselors definitely deserve to be punished for what they did. What they did here could fall under the category of gross negligence, and for something like vehicular manslaughter for example, a person could face up to 10 years in prison for such a transgression. It stands to reason then that two teenagers who were aware enough of their responsibilities to perform a job such as camp counseling might receive a similar, less severe sentence for their crimes. Though because they are underage, that would undoubtedly weigh in their favor were they to be tried in court. With that in mind, Pamela was justified in seeking punishment for the people responsible for her son's supposed death. But she was not justified in sentencing them to the ultimate punishment herself. Though again, Pamela was clearly not of sound mind when she committed her crimes, so that must be taken into account when evaluating her actions. The same thing can be said for Jason. Jason is a monster, but he was a monster who was made by the circumstances of his birth, parentage, overall environment, and the ridicule and negligence of others. A man made into the creature he became by outside forces that never chose to be who he is. The story of Jason Voorhees is as sad as it is terrifying. He's a force of nature whose brutality knows no limits, and whose actions find their motivation in bloodthirst. You cannot reason with Jason Voorhees. No amount of pleading or begging will tug on his heartstrings, nor will it inspire him to show you any sort of mercy. He is for all intents and purposes, a vessel of death and destruction that can't even be killed, an immortal terror reanimating time and time again to fulfill one purpose, and one purpose only, to kill everyone in his path. But it didn't have to be this way for Jason. He was once innocent, but that innocence was warped and corrupted by others. And if anything, the story of Jason Voorhees shows us that even a small amount of neglect can result in a stupefying amount of evil. 
Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Jason? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.